uh, welcome all the speakers and our participants for joining this uh, program. Uh, like every year, we are joining this, uh, organizing this. This budget has been presented um, in the parliament in a very unprecedented situation. Uh, we all know that the economy has been uh, badly hit by pandemic and related measures. So uh, there is a huge demand constant recession or whatever uh, term you can use. And there is also a kind of consensus that government needs to boost up demand. So we need some sort of expansionary fiscal policy. And indeed, uh, people claim that, yes, it has been the case. Uh, there has been several packages in the past and in over the last one year, uh, there has been uh, about 14% more than what it was budgeted. And again, we are uh, having an expansion of, of similar nature. But is it good enough? Uh, is the expansion enough for boosting the demand and get the economy back on track? More importantly, uh, whether we, uh, while we see uh, a substantial expansion in terms of fiscal deficit, uh, so is that a measure of expansion because if fiscal deficit is coming at the cost of, uh, uh, you can say, taxation uh, reduction, <coughs> huge tax concession has been given. So is that a good idea? Has that helped? And more importantly, if we are doing deficit financing and if we're spending money on certain uh, heads, uh, where exactly we should have spent and where we are spending, are they good enough to boost the demand inside the country or the way we are spend, going to spend will actually increase more of imports and more of uh, consumption of luxury goods? These are important issues. Now, this also brings us back to uh, what has been the flavor of the day, Atmanirbhar Bharat and industrial policy. Uh, so, uh, what has been the lack of sources of lack of competitiveness of India industry? That is an important uh, aspect to look at. Whether budget has uh, done anything on that? Now, people talked about wage rate, but many people say wage rate is not a big thing. But education, you know, people are not skilled enough. Uh, cost of energy, uh, lack of adequate infrastructure. So these are uh, issues that need to be addressed. And of course, infrastructure got attention. Uh, we see huge projects uh, being declared, but uh, new dedicated freight corridors have been declared. But then one can also think that some 15 years back, we announced dedicated freight corridors, two of them, Eastern and Western. 15 years down the line, we have completed just about half of that. So if we could not complete those predicated freight corridors, announcing more, uh, what is the guarantee that what we're trying to do will be achieved? Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, health is an important issue, uh, which has been linked to the pandemic, but also because health is important for uh, making your labor uh, able, efficient. Now, uh, expectedly, the budget has uh, mentioned health a lot many times, and uh, uh, finance ministers specially mentioned uh, points about uh, uh, strengthening primary health center and all. But do we see, uh, you know, uh, concomitant allocation in the budget? You know, or is it that you know we are spending more on? Uh, rural drinking, but not on health infrastructure, or we'll be spending a lot of money on vaccination, but not strengthening this sector at all. So these are also important issues. We have uh, speakers for that. Informal sector is one uh, that, uh, of course, uh, need good attention because pandemic and uh, lockdown has affected hard that sector most. Uh, so do we have, have we done enough in the budget for that. Uh, and then, of course, agriculture is also uh, a topic of the season. We all know that farmers are sitting in the borders. So, of course, everybody expected that agriculture would 
uh, get uh, serious attention in, in this budget, but has that been done? Uh, so that is also important issue that need to be discussed. Then uh, one important aspect that has been highlighted is that FDI, you know, privatization, you know, uh, of public assets, which was there in the last year budget also, but the target could not be achieved. Whether that itself is a good or bad idea is a different story. But, uh, you know, if we could not do it last year, what is the guarantee that we will do this year? So, uh, are we in a position, situation where we we'll might get more of deficit? And of course, importantly, that, uh, you know, we talk about Atmanibar India and we are depending so much on foreign investment. So is there some some sort of mismatch? You know, the the idea is that, you know, uh, is it, it does it uh, gel with the concept of Atmanibar Bharat? These are important issues to be discussed. But lastly, I would also like to mention one point that FM talked about this budget will be historical, but PM talked about, you know, we had many, many budgets and this budget will be a kind of uh, a, a sequel to that. So what exactly did we see? Did we see a historical budget or did we see something incremental? In any case, now people say that budget has become annual ritual. Not much comes out of it because lot many decisions are taken throughout the year without, you know, budget, you know, as executive decision. So do we see this budget as really historical or it's a series of actions, one of that, you know, after GST has come, we know that budget doesn't take any decision on GST, it's done in GST Council. So of course, that is an important. So to discuss all these issues, we have, a, you know, a panel of very eminent experts. Uh, we have Professor Vishwaji Dhar from uh, JNU, uh, we have Professor Prabhin Jha, also from JNU. Uh, we have Professor Rama Baru, uh, who is uh, eminent uh, health experts, uh, uh, you know, uh, as is also from JNU. We have education expert, Professor Gavinda, who has been with uh, uh, NIPA earlier, but now uh, he's uh, with CSD as distinguished professor. We have uh, Professor uh, uh, T. Huck, who is a noted agriculture expert uh, and uh, who has been a researcher as well as uh, who played an important role in policy making for more than two decades. And we also have, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ashini Mahajan, who is the convener of Swadeshi Jagran Manch, who has been very active, you know, the organization as well as he as an expert has been active in uh, these economic issues. In, in particular, Atmanirbhar Bharat, you know, FDI and all kind, those kinds of issues. Uh, so we, we have a, a huge lined up of experts, uh, but not last but the least, you know, we have a chair uh, who, uh, who is president of CSD, Professor Muskundube, but he has been a distinguished diplomat, uh, an international bureaucrat, uh, as well as uh, an eminent education expert in his own right. So with these words and welcoming you all again, I would request uh, uh, Professor Dubey to take over the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, I will follow uh, the following order. I shall first give the floor to uh, those who would uh, speak on the uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, dimensions of the budget uh, and they can refer to particular aspects uh, or sectors. Uh, so then after that I will go on to those who uh, will present the experts view uh, in particular area uh, or areas uh, like Professor Govinda on education, Professor Ramabharu on health, but they are also free to comment generally on the budget. Because this time we are not splitting the session uh, into various groups. We are just one session because the uh, webinar lends itself to not more than two hours, uh, two and a half hours, even that is too much. 
So please uh, bear in mind that confine your nawaz to 10 to 12 minutes. No, no parallel talk, please, please. Uh, 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 so, uh, and then we would have about half an hour left uh, uh, after the presentation, and they will uh, then anybody can speak from the floor. Uh, so, by way of introductory remark, uh, I am not going to uh, go into the details of the provisions in the in the budget. If need be, uh, I may do it later. Uh, this is just to sort of uh, formally deserve my right. Uh, but uh, I am now going to highlight uh, some broader aspects. Uh, uh, the uh, global and the national context uh, in which uh, uh, the budget should be looked into. Uh, uh, the first thing is that uh, 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 you know, there is, a, uh, if you go through the speech of the finance minister, which I have tried to do, uh, there is an impression that uh, uh, the emphasis is on uh, uh, privatizing institutions and establishments, uh, you know, one after another, uh, and going to the extent of privatizing land also now. And uh, then uh, uh, developing new institutions, new establishments on private public mode, uh, which really is really when a public uh, uh, role gradually disappears. And so this is also a form of privatization, if one may look at it. Uh, now, this is one aspect of it. Uh, I mean, you have a goal of I mean, earlier when uh, the second thing is that uh, the selling, uh, you know, family silver or family assets uh, one by one. And I remember when, uh, you know, Committee on Commission Disinvestment was set up under, uh, uh, I think, Mr. Ramchandra, uh, who was also our ambassador in Brussels at that time. Uh, the idea was that uh, you, of course, you sell some uh, enterprises uh, and you let some languish, uh, but uh, the ones which are doing well, uh, you sell in order to plow, plow it back into the same industry to make it efficient uh, and change and bring about structural changes. It was not meant to be added to the general revenue of the government. Uh, now this budget makes it clear that this has become one of the main sources of the revenue of the, of the government. Uh, now, whether uh, this had been, this thinking had been fulfilled or not, it is a matter of uh, uh, discussion. I mean, as you see that uh, uh, in uh, the last budget, something like 1.2 uh, lakh rupees uh, was expected to be realized. In the present budget, it is about 1.7 lakh crores rupees. But the realization last year, was only 33,000 crores. So as uh, C.P. Chandrasekhar in his uh, uh, op-ed article in the Hindu has said that this is proving to be a wishful thinking. And the targets in this uh, uh, area have proved uh, very unrealistic. So if uh, uh, this expectation is not realized, then what, what the government will resort to? And uh, this is one thing. Other thing is that if you go on selling your family silver, uh, uh, then in the, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in moments of crisis, what would you fall back on? I mean, uh, in the, we have seen in the case of pandemic that in UK, uh, the, perhaps the entire thing had been handled by the, uh, you know, their system of public health, uh, put in place by Anurian Bevan, in 1952, in the immediate post-war war year, uh, and it's still continuing. I mean, some of the most conservative prime ministers could not scrap it because the way it has taken roots in the society and in the in the economy, and they have fallen back mainly on this 
for uh, uh, you know distributing uh, medicines uh, for vaccination uh, the us it is in mess and uh, so uh, they are thinking uh, immediately after starting the vaccination they are thinking of uh, uh, you know sort of putting it in the private sector uh, uh, then it is a source of income and if all this thing uh, is uh, disposed of uh, what the government would fall back on to get any project implemented to get any source to tap any source from where to mobilize additional resources uh, so this is a moot question uh, you know uh, second thing is that uh, uh, the liberal world order uh, is uh, has come in for uh, criticism uh, not now but from the beginning of the uh, this century and uh, world bank and the imf has accepted uh, several of the mistakes that it has uh, uh, they have committed and they have been saying last two decades or so that uh, we are now no longer opposed to government intervention but the issue is that uh, where to intervene and where not to uh, they have revised their position and has taken this view um, and uh, 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 now the point is that uh, in the overall global context of the drastic revision of the global uh, liberal order uh, is india going to be uh, the only major country is still sticking to it or it has to look into some of the more fundamental structural and basic problems of the economy and society if you see the program of joe biden uh, the emphasis is on uh, uh, removing inequality the emphasis is on uh, tackling racism uh, the emphasis is on uh, removing discrimination from society there is not a word of any of this thing in our budget or even in the speeches that are being uh, made uh, uh, from the very high level uh, on economic on economic issues so we are really swimming against the tide in the world order and and those who sort of have given rise to this tide and uh, unleashed it like imf world bank washington consensus quintessentially and the countries of development countries and some of the important uh, uh, you know uh, countries which are coming up they are revising uh, they are now thinking as to how to remove these structural problems of discrimination uh, both social and economic and inequality and uh, we don't pay any attention uh, to it at all third is that uh, uh, the uh, 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 reliance on foreign capital now with uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, 70 years of experience of development when uh, at no stage of time foreign capital contributed uh, uh, more than you know 2 to 3% of the total investment made in our country how can any government uh, uh, predicate its uh, uh, development in the future years on the inflow of foreign capital and the way the figures are presented in the distorted way there's another, another thing that uh, you would uh, discuss perhaps is uh, now there was a sort of half headline in newspapers that india is the second has been able to attract second largest volume of inflow of foreign capital uh, after china at least we considered that china has attracted the largest amount and our second largest was in the range of 49 million or 50 million or so and it is lower than what we achieved only about a year or two years ago when it has gone up to 60 and 65 million billion billion dollars and then in the pandemic year we attracted about 49 to 50 billion dollar and we advertised in the newspaper that you know second largest in the world now what this 49 billion means uh, in the context of the uh, you know sort of massive need for resources 
of the country. And, and uh, then to highlight it uh, in newspapers and in the budget speech also, uh, that uh, some of the things that we will meet will be through the inflow of foreign private capital. Is, uh, you know, is uh, neither here nor there. I mean, this, that doesn't mean anything. Lastly, I would say that uh, uh, the uh, last two, three years, we were riding on the on the anarchy and uh, you know sort of violence of rules of law uh, unleashed on the world economy and world order by Trump. Now this is not going to be so in the coming years. Uh, the Joe Biden is going to work together with the Western countries uh, in uh, uh, restoring the world order, which eminently suited their purpose and on, on which we were also riding. Uh, and we, then we will have to uh, be accountable, accountable uh, against the standard of the rules that had been laid down in the, in the World Bank, uh, you know, to some extent in Ankar, uh, IMF. And then this uh, protectionist uh, uh, measures that are being adopted and being uh, announced from time to time, uh, we will be hard put to justify that, uh, whether it is uh, by way of uh, additional subsidization of, of, of agriculture or by way of the levy of uh, customs duty on manufactured products. I mean, I would request uh, uh, Professor Bishwajit Dhar to comment on it. Uh, so these are my broad comments. I would not like to comment on the uh, how much has been reduced and how much has been increased. Uh, uh, though I know the figures are under most of the important headings, because that will that will come up uh, by those who will be speaking on the subject. And lastly, before I uh, conclude, uh, uh, I mean uh, I hope that some of you will speak on the. The way figures are being have been used uh, in the last few years uh, under the present government uh, in uh, uh, projecting success and achievement of the government uh, in uh, uh, making provisions in the budget. Now take the health sector. Uh, you have something like uh, you know whatever uh, uh, hundred. Uh, 37% uh, increase and uh, 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 thousands of crores of, uh, of uh, income. Now, there is no as compared to the last budget. It is a sum total of the cost that is likely to be incurred in implementing the ongoing projects and some of the new projects which have been announced. Now, what do you compare this with? I mean, unless you had such a package in the past, and if there was such a package in the past, after one or two years, the loss of the projects uh, you know, is diminished, and uh, the government doesn't even refer to these projects, and comes out with uh, something new, which has uh, an additional you know, sort of gloss. Uh, and uh, that these are announced uh, on appropriate occasions, but they are not comparable. And comparable could be the figures provided in the current budget as compared to the, uh, you know, the budget estimate of the last year and the actual expenditure of the last year. <laughs> if you look at it in this way, then in the health sector, there is even a reduction. Uh, similarly, uh, in uh, education sector, education sector, there is clearly a reduction. 5,000 crores in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, is, uh, elementary school education. And if you take Samar Krishik Chabyan, which includes uh, teachers training uh, also, and uh, uh, they are uh, about 7,000 crores, they get a reduction. So this assemblies of projects and their cost being announced as a kind of an additional 
investment. It is apparently misleading. And I hope that some of you will comment on that. So I shall confine myself only to this at this stage and proceed to uh, you know, give the floor to those who would be uh, speaking on uh, these particular aspects of the project or on the general macroeconomic aspects. And I think uh, at the top of our list is uh, uh, Professor Bashwajiddar. And uh, it is not only because of the, uh, because I have read the article which he had written in the Amal Bazar Patrika, uh, uh, but also I think uh, uh, now he's a very senior professor and he should have uh, the first go at it. Bashwajiddar. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm really honored uh, that you've given me the, the first, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to go first. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to be here and uh, share one's thank views. You. There, is, there is someone, uh, Akhil, there is someone who's coming in and, uh, you know, there is this I don't know, sir. I have written personal... Uh, no, this is someone's number, number 227 E7 E uh, E73499. This person is uh, coming in. I don't know who this is, but can you just uh, send a message, please? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Akhil. No, let me... Let me, uh, let me start from uh, where... Uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Dube, you know, made a very important point about uh, the budget, you know, and people's perception of the budget that, you know, it's an annual exercise and uh, it should be treated as such. Now, I think uh, one of the important, the, the most important thing that people sort of often ignore is that uh, in the absence of the planning process now, the budget is the only document we have where the government gives a holistic uh, view as to which way it is going. So the, the direction of the of the economy, the direction in which it wants to drive the economy, <clears throat> is um, is available only from the budget. You don't have any other document or any other um, you know uh, uh, you know uh, forum from which you can really understand what the government wants to do with this. Uh, with the, with the economy. And, and therefore, there are very important lessons here as to where the government really wants to take this economy and uh, what, uh, uh, what, what, what is in for the, for the future. So I think, I think that's the thing that needs to be recognized first and the foremost. The second thing that I would like to uh, highlight is that, uh, you know, if both in the economic survey and in the budget, uh, the you know the, the the finance minister and the chief economic advisor they have been highlighting they have highlighted uh, the uh, you know the problem of covid and you know the covid induced crisis that the indian economy has, has suffered from now, now um, but there is no recognition that the that the indian economy until the uh, covid actually struck in in, in march until then, for nine consecutive quarters, the Indian economy was on a slowdown. In fact, uh, you know, uh, I, one should go even further back because in from 2017, 16-17, uh, uh, in, in one of the quarters, the growth rate was 8.1%. From then, it has been a downturn, da, sort of a downward hill. In between, there was a blip uh, where it went up to uh, seven percent plus and then it has been you know sort of nine con continuous quarters where uh, th there's been this, this down so the, the point that we have all been making for the past you know nine months ten months is that you know there are structural infirmities that the e indian economy su suffers from and the most important of these is uh, what professor dubey was also mentioning is a is a severe demand constraint that uh, that, that we are experiencing. So, um, and uh, Praveen, uh, I'm sure will elaborate on, on this further. The state of the labor market uh, gives, you know, sort of uh, telltale signs as to what is really happening 
uh, to the to the state of demand, and and uh, and the point that uh, I would like to make at the outset is that without oh, without without uh, uh, seriously looking at uh, at uh, stimulating demand, uh, Indian economy is is not going to go anywhere. Uh, and uh, it, this is this is clear to everyone. I think uh, the government has been trying to, uh, uh, you know, stimulate the economy through completely wrong means. For instance, in 2019, it went and uh, offered uh, huge tax concessions to the corporates. The, the corporation tax was brought down. Ostensibly, the the the, the message was that we are trying to come down to the, uh, you know, international levels in Indian. You know, the effective tax rate is far too high. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are coming down to uh, the globally acceptable levels, but the the the, the point that uh, is is uh, is often glossed over. And this is where I think I'd like to highlight the point that uh, Professor Dubey also has been making. That uh, you know the way the numbers have been presented. And, uh, <laughs> It's a it's a request to all the audience. Please keep your microphone off. It's a great disturbance to the speakers. I have been writing it continuously. Why don't you, as an administrator, mute all the all the microphones? You can mute mute all the microphones, and only the speaker will switch on the microphone. Yeah, I think you should do right. that. And yeah, mute all of them, and you can really uh, the, the speaker will uh, switch on. Yeah. Professor Dhar, can you unmute yourself now? Just please check if you can unmute. Yeah, all right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This okay, all right. okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you are okay, audible. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so, um, uh, so the way these numbers have been presented and the, uh, fa the, the fact of the matter is that there have been huge concessions that have been given to the corporates, left, right and center. And, and each, each year we have been looking at these numbers of revenue foregone, uh, which the, uh, the government has been uh, presenting uh, pretty diligently. I think it was first introduced in 2005 by, uh, by UPA, Dr. Manmohan Singh's uh, government had introduced it. And every year we have been looking uh, uh, with, with a uh, great deal of... Uh, uh, unease, the kind of concessions that have been given. So, if you look at the concessions that have been given the corporates, uh, and and then try to uh, understand what the tax rates are, you will you will you will get to understand the reality that these the corporates have been severely undertaxed, and uh, uh, you know opportunities for taxing the the, the the you know the the constituency that needs to be taxed. Uh, is 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 repeatedly being sort of uh, given a, a go by. Now another another important aspect, and I'll just focus a bit on the resource mobilization part, because uh, staying on this issue of corporate uh, taxation, again in this document on uh, revenue foregone, there is uh, a table that the government gives. Very interesting table. Many many people actually miss that table. Is the first table in this uh, annexure, which gives the corporate uh, you know the uh, uh, the uh, details of the corporates which have been which have been filing e returns, and there are about more than eight lakh com companies. And out of these eight lakh companies, you find that we find that uh, uh, more around forty five percent of these companies are, are, have declared either losses or they, they they declared that they are not they are not making any profit. So the, these companies are actually going scot free. So there is there is no tax on them. And and if you look at uh, if you consider the, the the companies which are declaring profits of five hundred crores or more, out of eight lakh companies, this number is only four hundred and twenty four. Now, now this is absolutely unbelievable that you know in in a, in a in a country like India, you know we have these big corporate entities here, that five hundred crores or more is being made by only four hundred twenty four companies. So I think you know there is. 
there is this kind of uh, 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 you know uh, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm almost compelled to say that there is uh, this deliberate uh, tendency to ignore those who should be taxed and, uh, and, and therefore the revenue side uh, looks, looks really thin. Um, so in that context, you know, all these discussion about uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, this budget has stimulated the economy a great deal by just looking at the uh, the 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 deficit which the, uh, the 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 budget deficit that the fiscal deficit that has been announced this i think is barking up the is, is, a, is a wrong tree completely it doesn't doesn't give uh, uh, a real real picture at all now um now, uh, uh, i was i was talking about this document on revenue foregone but interestingly in this budget the uh, the uh, this document has actually gone missing what has been included is last year's document with a bit of updating of the numbers. So we actually don't know. We are not. We are up in up to speed as to what has happened. Uh, you know, last two years uh, on 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 the tax tax concession. So the corporate tax break that was given, uh, uh, you know, one and a half years back. The real impact of it in terms of uh, what we are talking about. The ability of the of the of the government to tax these uh, corporates that is not available to us. So I think uh, there is a there is a serious lacuna there in the budget. Now the re revenue accruals uh, really tell us another story, and and this is that uh, the projections for 2021-22 show that uh, these uh, projections are actually lower than the budget estimates of 2021. So, uh, so there's there's another thing very clear that according to the government, despite what the uh, the, the CEA had mentioned about this V-shaped uh, uh, recovery and you know Indian economy coming back to steep to you know to, to normal in 2021-22, now the government's own estimates about uh, uh, the the tax collections tell us that this is not going to be normal. Uh, we are still will still be below the the the, the, the pandemic level, and therefore uh, it was imperative for the government to have done much more in terms of stimulating the economy. And why was this why was this more more important? Because uh, what we have seen uh, uh, from from the government is that as compared to other uh, G20 countries, it, it peers. The st fiscal stimulus provided by India was was one of the lowest. So uh, IMF uh, you know, tells us that uh, uh, the fiscal stimulus was only three point one percent of the GDP. Uh, the 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 twenty percent of GDP uh, uh, economic package which was talked about was uh, was uh, and, and we also did our calculations. Uh, had a lot of other things, but it was not the fiscal stimulus which could have actually stimulated demand if it was, of course, if, if it was used in a particular in, a, in the in the right kind of a manner, and and that has to be emphasized because fiscal policy on its own is not the solution. We have to put the money where the mouths are, where the where the, where, where uh, the the needs are, and. Um, and and what we find is that uh, this budget and uh, uh, it, um, you know scheme after scheme, wherever there was a need to uh, to to put in the funds in order to stimulate demand, that uh, opportunity has been sort of missed. Uh, so let me give uh, one or two examples, and I'm sure our other colleagues will elaborate on them uh, further. You know the the narrative of spending, for instance. You know the the good news, there's a good news and a bad news. The good news is that uh, in, in the pandemic times, spending actually uh, had gone up. This is what the revised estimates uh, tell us. But the proposed uh, uh, figures show a sharp decline from, uh, uh, you know, the increase that was uh, that, that was made in the past several months. So which, which again tells a story that the government thinks that this is only a pandemic-induced crisis. There is no structural problem. And, and therefore, you know, they think that, you know, the moment, uh, you know, we declare that we are uh, free from COVID, everything is going to come back to normal. 
And again, as I said, ignoring the fact that there were structural deficiencies that the economy was uh, suffering from. And here again, you know, there's been a lot of discussion or a lot of uh, um, uh, talk about uh, uh, in investing in infrastructure. Now, all these uh, announcements that have been made uh, are in uh, the big infrastructure projects. But uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the rural areas, you know, in the, uh, uh, the infrastructure that would have really helped agriculture to overcome the crisis that it is facing, and especially in times like this, when there is this, uh, uh, you know, the agitation that have been that we are seeing, uh, proper focus on Narega could have actually brought uh, the, uh, you know, the, the focus back on investment on on investment that agriculture needs. So uh, I think it's it's a, it's a double warmy, you know, bringing down the uh, the uh, spending on Narega. Is a double warmy is going to is going to hit hit the economy uh, uh, twice. Um, I also wanted to you know there are lots of things things to say, but I know in the in the interest of time, I'll just focus on uh, two things that again the, uh, uh, Professor Dubey had very rightly focused on. One is uh, the whole thing of foreign borrowing, and if you look at the foreign uh, foreign borrowing external assistance uh, the number that has been given. This is a historically high level, uh, it's gone reached a historically high level of 91,000 crores. Uh, this is what is being uh, proposed in the uh, revised estimates. And uh, of course, uh, you know, this shows uh, uh, 21, 20, 21, 22 figure, figure shows a, 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 a decline. But I think with the, the government not really intending to tax those who should be taxed and, and, and relying on borrowing, including for external borrowing, this is something that is uh, uh, a serious, serious problem. Um, on, 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 um, again, on, on privatization, uh, uh, Professor Dubey quite rightly said that, uh, uh, you know, IMF has actually been uh, uh, emphasizing a lot on the importance of state-owned enterprises, uh, and uh, in their recent fiscal monitors, they have been uh, they have been actually uh, uh, giving this evidence that since the economic downturn of 2008, there has been a spurt in stab as, uh, on, on reliance on uh, state-owned enterprises in the, in the in the West, and they have become major drivers in many of the of the Western economies. Uh, contrary to that. Kind of experience that uh, we are seeing from the Western countries, India is is downsizing its uh, uh, you know uh, state-owned enterprises, and and most of them are are, are, are on on the block now, and I think uh, what the government intends to do is is really uh, to ensure that our, our, that all these enterprises are phased out. They are they are they are putting them into private hands. And, and that, I think that is the ultimate objective uh, with which the government is moving forward. Uh, now, it's also interesting uh, that uh, the FDI numbers that the government is uh, uh, talking about and this, this discussion that India has been attracting a whole huge uh, volume of FDI uh, doesn't really tell another story, which is that uh, much of this FDI has come in through the through uh, selling uh, uh, existing enterprises. So, if you look at uh, the uh, the operations of uh, uh, of Reliance and the extent to which they have sold their shares to foreign companies, you you can really understand the situation. So, the whole uh, scenario that is uh, turning out in this country is that you have the government, which is now selling its own enterprises to to the corporates. The corporates are selling their their uh, you know the critical strategic uh, uh, you know shares to foreign companies. So so in which direction is this uh, this economy going? That is a big question that must must be asked. Um, Sahib also asked me to respond uh, on this whole question of uh, of uh, lowering of uh, of uh, increase increase in. Uh, uh, customs duties and this whole Atmanirbhar Bharat. You know, I have been taking this position that this, this, this Atmanirbhar Bharat, you know, this kind of self-reliance at this point in time is uh, is, is not really 
uh, you know, feasible, nor is it desirable. We have to be very strategic in terms of developing our ind industries. Uh, a general kind of clarion call that, you know, we are actually becoming inward looking is not something that uh, is uh, is desirable for a country of India. India size, a country which is has uh, so much of engagement with the, with the uh, global economy. And uh, uh, going forward, uh, I hope the government actually uh, reviews uh, its its uh, stance that it is uh, it it has taken now. I'm sure that uh, you know in the coming months we are going to see a wholesale. Uh, in revision of customs duties, that's what the, the finance minister has, has promised. But I hope we don't become uh, uh, inward looking to such an extent that it starts hurting the economy in the longer run. So, so these were some of the, you know, sort of uh, scattered thoughts that I had, uh, you know, uh, the time uh, uh, that I could uh, use here. And thank you for your attention. सर एक बार आप अपना माइक अनम्यूट कर लीजिए मैंने मैंने कर कर दिया मैंने। नहीं नहीं मैं प्रोफेसर दुबे को कह रहा हूँ उनका माइक बंद है कैन यू हियर मी नो हाँ जी अब आवाज आ रही है सर सो वन पॉइंट इज दैट the size of the rest two package uh, uh, you know the government uh, claimed even in the first package that it was 20% of the gnp and if you add the three packages together then it could very well go up to 30% or 40% of the gnp and uh, as opposed to that uh, you have the figure of uh, 2.5 to 3% mentioned by uh, bishwajit uh, but i have read an article by nagarath uh, from uh, Uh, Travandrum, uh, uh, where he said it is just one percent, and the real real two pack package is just one percent of the GNP, and whenever it involved uh, large scale transfer of funds to the poor, the distressed, etc., uh, there is a ceiling being uh, put on that, and Mandraga is a uh, one striking example of how it is uh, being brought uh, down. and the second thing is that on the whole question of uh, you know the restoring the rule of law in the field of uh, uh, trade uh, flow of capital uh, and uh, sort of restoring back the world order which was given a goodbye by trump and uh, and as i said that we rode on the crest of that uh, we cannot argue there will be a strong big to restore the story in the Form in which it existed, uh, and we cannot oppose that. Uh, we have been a party to it in the past negotiations. Uh, it is a uh, very difficult to sell the point that we are in favour of the continuing chaos and violation of rule of law. So, if, uh, if the new U.S. administration, along with the Europeans, take a view that they will restore it uh, as it prevailed before Trump, uh, we, we have to be seen as a uh, One of the leading uh, powers uh, trying to bring that about, but at the same time we know that this world order has built in elements of discrimination against us, and we have opposed it uh, from the 60s, and I have been personally a part of uh, that opposition. 20-30 years I have done it in my career, and uh, and uh, and the new laws that have been uh, framed. Uh, under the Uruguay round and uh, proposed by the developed countries from time to time, involving other flows, uh, we have been opposed to that. Uh, so it is a very delicate task of uh, joining the new U.S. administration and European countries to restore the world order that it existed three, four years ago. And at the same time, uh, making the point of view that this must be reformed. I mean, we have some proposals on the table, like recently that uh, uh, you know the vaccination uh, for the coronavirus uh, uh, should not be subjected to IPR regime, and uh, the, the no company could claim IPR on that thing. It will be 
free for utilization by all the countries of the world. This proposal has not been accepted. You have administration, past administration, and I don't think that the present administration is going to accept that. But we have one or two proposals we have made. We have been making it from time to time, right from the beginning. It's a very delicate task of restoring it, restoring an, an inequitable, discriminatory world order, uh, which existed before. Uh, and while doing so, continuing our past role of bringing about equality in it. And I don't know to what extent the government is aware of this delicate task or they just want to take an opportunity to prove that whenever there is an opportunity we will violate and uh, we will forget about long-term restructuring. We are not so much concerned about the shape of the world order to emerge 10 years, 20 years hence. It is not, uh, I mean, it is not for India to think about and we, we go on claiming that we are making contribution uh, in this area, in that area, but we have no structure orderly view of how things can be reordered. Re and, uh, and so this, I'll just put across this point of view. Sorry for taking time in between. Now I give the floor now to Professor Pravin Jha to speak. Professor Jha. Thank you very much, sir. Professor Dubey, Professor Nanda, all fellow panelists, my greetings again to all of you. And it is indeed a pleasure to be part of this conversation. I think a number of very, very important points have been made by Professor Dubey, Professor Nanda, and Professor Dar. And uh, I'll just uh, build on some of those things largely in a macro context without getting into the nitty gritty of the rural issues. We can get into some of those subsequently if there is a clarification and question and so on. Now, the first point that I would like to underscore is, and which has already been said, that our macroeconomic context is in a complete mess both internally and increasingly externally. Now, if you look at the standard indicators, very standard indicators, GDP growth, as um, was mentioned, you know, we have been for quite a while on a downslide before the pandemic, nine quarters, as was mentioned by Bishwajit, and then subsequently, you know, things have been uh, uh, much worse, as we know. In any case, even that uh, pre-pandemic year growth rate has been revised, as you know. It has brought down from 4.2 to 4 now. If we look at far more important indicators, I mean, GDP growth is something which uh, is not the most important indicator in my uh, understanding and so on. What is far more important is to look at, for instance, per capita consumption, right? It is to look at what is happening to employment and so on. Now, I'll mention just these two. If we look at, if we go by the NSS uh, estimates and so on, 11, 12, and subsequently 17, 18, per capita consumption in rural India declined by nine percentage points. Now, this is well known. But this is the context which we need to keep in very sharp view if we have to make any progress in terms of policy management and so on. This is unprecedented in independent India. This has never happened. Per capita consumption over a period of a quinquennium or more, five, six years, going down by that order and it happened across the sides the topmost decile to bottommost decile you know each one of these and this is amazing right if we look at unemployment again a great deal has been uh, written and spoken about it we really are talking of unprecedented crisis in terms of unemployment yeah. i mean everyone knows this figure of uh, in uh, almost half a century or so, 
before the pandemic we were already at the highest and then subsequently you no know, we may sort of quibble over the exact figures and so on yeah what exactly is uh, for a variety of reasons there is lot of controversy there but the fact is that pandemic could have only worsened it and there is no escape out of that if we look at for instance credit flow you no know, almost every agency is telling you that we are in a terrible spot and possibly the worst spot in more than half a century 50 to 60 years right if we talk of investment over again more than a decade yeah and so on so if we look at the macro indicators very standard macro indicators it is so evident it should be very clear to a class 5 7 8 child that we are in a complete mess now why is it that this recognition is not there why is this this very elementary kind of cognition is not there what do we see on the contrary this massive back thumping massive kind of you know cheering one's own performance now unless we start with this very basic thing that look things may be bad let's try and address these and these are not only because of the pandemic but a whole lot of structural issues the context is there and how do we deal with that that elementary honesty is something which certainly is not part of this regime in fact i do not know of and cannot think of any government anywhere in the world i mean i'm not only talking of preceding governments in india which has succeeded so much in disregarding the facts manufacturing lies it's just amazing i mean the scale of it right one particular figure regarding fiscal stimulus was uh, mentioned earlier right now of course by several economists who have been very critical of this 20% of gdp figure we know and almost every agency in the world put it between 1 and 3% you know that has been the range Maybe we can again quibble over what exactly should go in there and so on and so forth but again something so elementary and so basic a class 10 student of economics knows that you do not collapse the fiscal and the monetary and talk of the fiscal it was so basic you know who to figure continuously has been harped on as professor dube mentioned that now they are saying almost 30% yeah if you if you look at that interestingly the economic survey which was stable as it happens that itself makes a correction in that and puts the figure around 2% of gdp now i i'm not sure whether his job is on the line whether the finance minister has uh, and the prime minister has uh, looked at that figure right uh, that uh, actually the fiscal stimulus was much less than uh, uh what has been talked about and so on so this is the first point i wanted to highlight the context being in a complete mess endless manufacturing of lies you know it's like uh, you know this this as if no tomorrow in terms of uh, kind of figuring out new ways of lying and so on you know we are we are we are trapped in that kind of context so that's that that's the first point yeah uh on gdp etc whether it would be 22 23 24 again there are lots of uh, economists incidentally geeta gopinathan who was here she probably uh, is of the view you know on uh, officially i am of view that possibly it would be 25 26 you know by then this recovery kind of uh, would be in uh, uh, on track so to say right if you look at many economists outside the policy uh, spokespersons of the government they are saying that actually the contraction might be much higher yeah, i mean you have uh, sort of uh, uh, those who are thinking in terms of uh, well above 10% in this fiscal to about uh, 7.5% which is the government figure and so on so all these figures and as it happens given the 
very terrible truth that the data agencies, our statistical systems have been so massively messed up, it becomes very difficult to sort of swear by any particular number. And so that's the other, you know, Professor Dubey uh, rightly highlighted, uh, the, the challenge of assaulting institutions. And one of the biggest assaults, and I don't know what, whether to call it biggest assault, I mean, everything has been assaulted so badly that, that uh, uh, there should be no hierarchy in terms of uh, the degree of assault maybe uh, uh, in this conversation. But, uh, you know, it just, just becomes so, so, so difficult, right? Uh, coming specifically to the budget, then, you know, this, this, this whole uh, claim, uh, which was repeated uh, by um, uh, the finance minister following on the economic survey, spend, spend, spend. Just start looking at the numbers. What spend? Where have you spent? Right? Now, it is indeed the case that in terms of the overall revised estimate, yes, things have increased, etc. Yeah. But once we start making sense of that, for instance, something which was supposed to be a different methodology, right? And now that you account for, now I'm referring to FCI, and now you say that, you know, this is something which should be accounted for as it happens from this year, and uh, as regards the revised estimate as, 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 as well, suddenly, you know, the numbers change. So in terms of fiscal expansion, it becomes a trickery, right? It is acknowledging a fiscal deficit, and rightly so, that limited transparency is most welcome, right? But, you know, that essentially then tells you that it's something which is not really a real expansion anywhere, right? So this increased sort of, uh, you know, amount accounted for now for FCI and so on, and that is, uh, and then consequently, various figures relating to food security and so on will uh, will 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 come into uh, serious question, as has been pointed out by a number of experts in the last uh, couple of days and so on. Right? So, the revenue, revised revenue, it sort of goes up to almost uh, thirty-four lakh uh, crores, right? and uh, uh, likewise, the expenditure also uh, kind of increases somewhat. But if you look at the overall revenue situation, what is the kind of downfall that we are uh, talking about? In the year 19, uh, sorry, 2018, 19, it was already from the projected, from the budget estimate to the revised, it was already 1,90,776 crores. In the year 2019-20, it was 297,772 crores, almost 3 lakh crores. Right? This year, it's already more than 4 lakh crores and so on. Yeah? Uh, and it's only the revised estimate. We don't quite know what the final figure will, uh, you know, would be, etc. That's the kind of uh, challenge in terms of fiscal space, which the country has to and the policy makers have to come to terms with that we are in a very very difficult kind of fiscal space sort of uh, context and why has that happened it has happened precisely for the reasons which were highlighted by professor dube professor nanda and professor dhar right i mean business as usual is not going to be helping policy making you know, giving concessions to the corporate sectors, fudging of figures there, etc., and allowing them to go scot-free and so on, and more of the same. Where do you get the resources then? Where will the resources come from? Right? And acknowledging this increased fiscal deficit is you know, perfectly fine. And I think it's a good thing where sort of uh, at least an intent has been conveyed that, look, we are not too worried about fiscal deficit. And that point is well taken. But the whole question of getting the resources in place, where do we uh, get these from? Now, there 
the most important point the most important strategy seems to be something which is already massively discredited highly controversial sell more and more of india no like kelo india it has become selo india i mean this is amazing you know as was pointed out by professor dubey i mean how can you sort of uh, keep following this track which raises so many questions the same government you know b- 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 uh, our same party which was uh, uh, earlier outside uh, the government and so on what was its tune what was it saying that look i mean you know well, fortunately we have uh, ashwini majan dr majan who is part of this swadeshi jagran manch he, he he will probably tell us more about it that how livid this particular political formation was about selling anything and what happens now so that putting on the fast track further the amount 1,75 1.75 lakh crores has already been mentioned we know that uh, uh, 2018 it was uh, you know air india had been put on the block nothing has happened yeah, there are lots of problems so in any case hoping that through this disinvestment we will get uh, more resources is in any case questionable apart from the fact that this is probably not the best strategy yeah you have to be very strategic and professor dubey mentioned a particular committee and how to go about it nothing is even uh, acknowledged in terms of official strategy of disinvestment in that sense you know any kind of problems and how uh, what could be a better way etc etc then borrowing Now, borrowing is the other big thing but again it has its challenges etc right we can get into very difficult situation and uh, that uh, i mean they, it seems as if there is a kind of a, a, again a zero recognition of the challenges associated with that of course hoping that money will come but as professor dhar has already mentioned i mean the way this money is coming and what kind of things and basically acquiring things here and etc does that take us any further so lots of these sort of issues so basic point re- relating to the second point that i was trying to make is that in terms of a fiscal uh, strategy in terms of uh, an overall budgetary strategy resource mobilization strategy it has been stuck in a business as usual mode it is if anything moving towards something which is even more worrisome accelerated sale of uh, public uh, uh, entities and so on market borrowings of the kind that uh, is being talked about and so on now let me very quickly come to the so called um, you know the, the other side the expenditure side and so on uh for lack of time i will mean, i'll just take a couple of minutes and uh, uh, you know uh, try and uh, highlight uh, a few things you see one of the easiest thing to do in every budget as regards announcing expenditure claims is to talk of infrastructure you know nobody holds you ac- accountable for that after i mean i think some 5 6 years ago there was this talk of setting up uh, let's say uh you know aims in darbhanga what happened to that that got repeated again in the election campaign when bihar was going through that process right lots of things which have been announced many of these had had been announced earlier you know we have had a long history of it you know late jaswant singh talking of 60 lakh crores Uh, sort of uh, spending on infrastructure and that is when things started changing i mean you know it's basically around that time that this kind of bombastic claims of how we are spending massively on infrastructure right and then sort of claiming that uh, that will revive the economy you know much of it doesn't happen to the extent that it happens it grow it basically is addressed to some sort of a particular segments and friends and family who are dealing with those kinds of infrastructure uh, sort of uh, uh, programs and so on right so it again needs to be examined very very carefully uh, as regards this whole question of 
those areas, those sectors which could have given a decent push to demand, each one of those, each one of those has been squeezed further. Rural economy, MSMEs, I mean, we are talking of numbers, 70%, 80% have gone under the sea. Look at All India Manufacturer, uh, manufa Manufacturers uh, or, or Organization. Uh, Mr. Raghunathan, who keeps giving you these figures on a, almost on a daily basis, right? Huh. Two biggest components of What are we doing to them? Nothing. So any serious addressing of the demand challenge, the demand question is nowhere in the horizon. It is basically hoping that it will happen. I mean, good. it's good to be an optimist, but then to be an optimist, at least there should be some elementary reasons, some elementary policy interventions and so on. And, uh, very last word, you know, I, I sort of uh, mentioned uh, that there has been a, some improvement in uh, transparency in terms of, let's say, taking care of some off-budget items which were not shown earlier, and that's a good thing. But as was pointed out, if you look at the health sector and what has been said, it's complete opacity. It's giving up on that transparency. What have you done? Basically, even the finance commission allocations have been added in that. What kind of, you know, I mean, can, can we at least expect some honesty in budget making processes? Yeah. Something which is over a period of five years, you certainly add that and you do other things, you merge schemes and so on. I'm sure uh, Professor Rama Baru <laughs> will give us lots of details and so on. But it is not confined only to the health. You read the fine print, this has happened across sectors. No accountability. Everything is fuzzy. Uh, people were uh, claiming that, you know, fantastic, much more transparent and so on. No. In fact, it has ended up and ended us in a context where that transparency has been seriously compromised. I think I have uh, taken more time than uh, I should have. Uh, my apologies, uh, sir, uh, Professor Dubey, uh, for, for uh, it in, in case I have overshot too much. Uh, thank you for your attention. I would love to respond to anything that uh, uh, participants and others may want to raise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Uh, now, the next speaker is Mr. Ashwini Mahajan. Uh, uh, he will also be speaking on the uh, you know, sort of general remarks on the budget and on the macroeconomic aspect and anything else. Just keep in mind the time constraint that uh, all of us have. Professor Mahajan. Uh Thank you, uh, respected uh, Muskan Dubeji. Uh, it's really an honor to be uh, on the panel headed by you, uh, Professor uh, Vishwajit Dhar, Professor Praveen Jha, Professor Nityanandji, Professor Rama Baru, Professor Gobinda, Professor T. Haak, and uh, the convener of the today's panel discussion, uh, Dr. Akhil. Uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, with you. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I will not be so critical uh, Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay. You are audible. audible. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Frankly speaking, I will not be so critical about the budget as uh, uh, Professor Pruin Jha, uh, but definitely there are points I, I would like to make about the budget. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, I would uh, appreciate this budget on one count, that this budget is providing more 
of capital expenditure than the previous budgets. Uh, we have seen uh, in the past the capital expenditure had been coming down and down and uh, but uh, what is appreciable about uh, the government's expenditure uh, in the last budget they budgeted for 4.1 lakh for, uh, crores for capital expenditure which actually went up to 4.39 in the revised estimates and uh, the this the next the fiscal 2021-22 this uh, figure is going to be 5.454 uh, lakh crores so this is something uh, i would appreciate about the budget second thing uh, which is appreciable about the budget is uh, uh, an increased spending on the health 137 percent increase and uh, in uh, as a student of economics uh, Mm, professor uh, mm, Professor Pruin Jhaji and uh, Professor Bishwajit Dharji would agree with me that uh, over the years, our overall social expenditure, the expenditure on the social sectors has remained almost stagnant uh, and individually false. also we see uh, whether education or health or others uh, 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 or say minority affairs or SCST or others. So we uh, overall the figure used to be uh, as I write in my book uh, about 10% uh, they, they budget for uh, in the total budget and uh, actually it comes to 9.3 9, 9 to 9.5% over the years I have found but uh, uh, I was happy to see uh, a 137 percent hike in the uh, in the <laughs> health budget. Uh, no doubt, uh, this year's uh, budget has been made in, in under special uh, situations, and therefore, uh, obviously, uh, 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 even uh, uh, no nobody has, uh, including this panel has criticized this budget on uh, on the count of uh, huge fiscal deficit uh, of the uh, in the revised estimates to 9.5% of the gdp and uh, the budget estimates of 6.8% of the gdp nobody is raising questions on that and uh, there are uh, uh, these uh, some of these good things about the budget i just uh, uh, because because before criticizing anything we, we must uh, appreciate the good points and uh, as uh, we uh, you are all aware uh, that we have a different point of view on uh, the disinvestment and on fdi when it comes to fdi uh, especially in the uh, finance sector whether it is banks or it is uh, uh, insurance sector we had been uh, opposing it when uh, uh, during uh, nda1 the government uh, was deciding to to introduce uh, fdi in insurance to 26 percent uh, at that point of time we opposed its tooth and nail and then at that point the government said that we are uh, introducing 26 percent uh, under the parliamentary uh, resolution that it will not be raised at that point of time also we said that once we are introducing it uh, ultimately it will be raised and that happened to it it was raised to 49 percent in the previous uh, regime and now it is uh, uh, increase to 74 percent this is uh, this is unfortunate uh, because uh, whether it is banks or financial institutions like uh, insurance uh, this is in a way uh, would be leading to the greater dominance of the foreign players on our domestic savings and our domestic finance which is in no way uh, uh, going to help the country. Uh, second thing is about uh, the disinvestment. Disinvestment we had been uh, opposed to, not for the reason that we are opposed to disinvestment. 
we are opposed to the the manner in which the disinvestment is uh, being carried out we are of the view that uh, it doesn't make any difference if me and uh, or uh, mr jidhar or or uh, um, uh, pravin jha owns the shares of the public sector companies or the government owns it but i would definitely object to if the 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 company is sold in wholesale to reliance or tata to anybody if it leads to more of uh, concentration of economic power if it leads to more of uh, more of monopoly then it is definitely objectionable so we opposed the disinvestment of air india but at the same time we suggested that the is the time to revive air india and uh, after the revival you can bring out bring out ipos and uh, sell the shares on the same lines as uh, as was done by british airways uh, in 1987 uh about other uh, disinvestments again uh, our uh, press release also had said that we are opposed to bpcl uh, disinvestment we are opposed to the bharat earth movers limited disinvestment and several others including the banks and insurance company now the question is uh, that what should be done on this investment front so uh, this is neither in the interest of the country nor in the interest of this government as well to go in for the strategic disinvestment as they are saying in the first 6 years first 5 6 years this government chose not to uh make use of strategic disinvestment and uh, they uh, actually went for equity disinvestment nobody objected to that but strategic disinvestment is something which is very much objectionable and uh, for that we had raised our voice and uh, we will be raising our voice further uh now when it comes to monetization of uh, the uh, infrastructure assets roads airports railways again we will have to ensure that through this monetization process are we going to increase the monopolies are we going to raise the uh, user charges in uh, air, airports as we have done in case of delhi and mumbai airport especially delhi airport uh, delhi airport has become the costliest airport in the world so uh, that is something which we must avoid regarding uh, uh monetization i think the best policy would be to pool all these assets in one basket and make it a company distribute these shares every the whole country would like to buy me and you will like to buy the shares of uh, that company because infrastructure is the sector which is giving us lot of revenue so why lose that revenue but at the same time uh, everybody would uh, appreciate this point that we need more and more money more and more, more finance to uh, to fund the infrastructure sector which the country doesn't have either you go for fdi which we are again uh, opposed to or we we go to the sovereign borrowing again which is which is uh, in a way suicidal so the way through which we can fund our infrastructure is we have to find novel ways to fund our infrastructure but monetization by selling it off to the corporates as we have done in case of airports uh, selling being sold to uh, uh, adani or uh, any other corporate house I, i think this is not a very advisable policy one thing last thing uh, i am so very happy about this uh, budget at least after after so many years of destruct destructing the long term financial institutions uh, like 
we we had uh, after the independence we had uh, uh, developed many long term financial organizations and they had helped uh, the uh, the need for long term finance maybe idbi uh, even I, uh, ifc i i c i c i but they ultimately they were converted into the banks and uh, they went into the private hands at least now the government has risen to the occasion that yes we need long term finance and that development financial institution uh, uh, the government has provided for the the uh, um, equity uh, seed equity of 20000 crores and uh, uh, hoping that it will uh, um, it will become a corpus of 5 lakh crores uh in the in the in the matter of next uh, uh, 3 to 5 years uh i think uh, i had these comments to be made on the budget uh, thank you thank you so much thank you very much dr mahajan i think you have made some very important points uh, clearly and precisely and this will be reflected in uh, the outcome of our discussion that we will bring out uh, now i think i'm going to the sectors i should uh, first take up uh, the sector which is a subject of much discussion in the country today the agriculture and farmers so professor hak i give, give you the floor uh, 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 before dr hak starts i would like to mention that professor uh, ashwini mahajan has to leave us in between because he has some important meeting in delhi university to attend thank you thank you very much dear for accommodating us thank you thank you uh, thank you sir thank you uh, thank you sir ak thank you sir i think i did not unmute it so i think now it is okay hopefully uh this year i think i don't have much because uh, it it does not look very spicy this year at least on agriculture uh well, at least so far i was very happy that there something it was substantial was there but this year i don't see much but anyway i must say that there was a general expectation that the budgetary allocation for agriculture and rural development this year it will be enhanced for two three regions one is of course this farmers agitation at least government should have done something to satisfy them to contain the agitation uh, and i must say that this agitation is not merely due to you know they are protest against the new farm laws actually it is rooted in some kind of farm crisis that is there in the country uh, as you know the recent financial inclusion survey by nabard soj the average monthly income of an agricultural household in the country is only rupees 8932 rupees and uh, in the case of states like uttar pradesh bihar odisha and some of these states it is even less than 7500 in case of bihar up it is the lowest 6600 rupees so and nearly 40% of the farmers today still depend on private money lenders for loan they don't get institutional loan whether cooperatives or banks and the average rate of interest of institutional and uh, in non institutional sources is 35% per annum in some cases it goes up to 60% also so once these people borrow from some such sources uh, at such high rate of interest there is no way then they can ever be out of the poverty trap or debt trap this is a real situation in the country today and uh, apart from that what the government did in the past few years they said farmers income will be real income will be doubled by 2022 and this year was the is the last year from that point of view in the sense based on whatever they do some kind of adjustment and all that in this year's budget probably some improvement could have taken place next year to reflect that there is some increase in the income of the farmers but that is not going to happen for another reason is that in the last 
six years from 2015 to till today, if you see the average agri prices, that is farm harvest prices or wholesale prices, it has declined like anything. In the sense, uh, early six years period and the recent six years period, if you see, earlier it used to be the average rate of you know, wholesale prices, the growth used to be six to 10% in the case of several agricultural commodities. Currently, it is only 2% or so. So farmers are really in deep distress and nobody recognizes this fact, whether the government or even the general people living in urban areas. That is the problem. Uh, in only yesterday I was buying some vegetables in Safal. They have, you know, Safal sells cauliflower at rupees nine a kilo. And in order to grow one or produce one kilo of, you know, cauliflower, you will know the kind of problems, not only fertilizer and pesticides and other things, but uh, even the kind of labor that they have to put, even the labor cost is not you know, covered by this. In the case of most of the crops, the, that is the kind of situation. So that is one reason why for the last few years they were demanding you know, legal guarantee for minimum support prices for all commodities, not just rice and wheat, for all agricultural commodities. It has not been properly conceptualized or put in a frame should have been the case, but that is the real problem. So after that, I think I will say, in view of this, we thought that this government will do something in this budget uh, to address some of these things and in terms of either announcement of schemes or giving higher allocation. Unfortunately, this has not happened. If you look at the budgetary allocation for agriculture and allied activities, it has come down even nominally from rupees 154, 1,54,775 crore in the budget estimates of 2020 and 21 to 1,48,300 crore. That means quite substantially, I should say, this year. Although, and even if you see the revised estimates of last year, it was 1,45,355 crore. That means by about 10,000 crores, I mean, has been slashed down in the budget of agriculture and allied activities. Instead of increasing, <laughs> this has come down. So, uh, but what is significant in the present context is that even what was originally allocated for agriculture and allied activities last year, it has also come down in the revised estimate of nearly, as I said, by rupees 10,000 crore. The allocation for rural development seems to have been increased to some extent from 1,44,000 817 crore in 2021 to rupees 1,94,633 crore in the estimates of this year. But it remains lower than the revised estimate of last year. Actual expenditure was much more last year than what was budgeted initially. But then this year's budget estimates should have been really based on the revised estimates because there are several things that need to be done in the rural uh, areas for, you know, the kind of demand creation that you are talking of through income generation and all that, that is not taking place. That is not going to take place. Last year, at least, there was some effort to maintain high level of expenditure uh, for Manrega and some other schemes, with PM Gram Sadak and PM Abbas and all that. But this year, I think this does not seem to be there. Uh, scheme wise, I think if we see some of the schemes that uh, very important schemes like PM Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana. I think last year it was allocated at 75,000 crores of rupees. In fact, that was the real kind of you know additionality in the agriculture sector in the last few years. In fact, earlier it used to be more or less constant in real terms, but last year 75,000 crores was the uh, budget that was put for this. But in the revised estimates, it came down to only 65,000 crores. And this year also, it has been put at that level. So that means there is no increase at all. Even for, I, in fact, everybody was thinking that this is too little. At least if you're talking of uh, pumping money into the agriculture and rural sector, 
in the hands of the poor people in order to boost consumption demand which can revive help revive the economy uh, through multiplier effect this has not come about uh, because this was a very important kind of scheme from that angle then similarly as all of us know agriculture is becoming a very risky kind of occupation day by day for various regions uh, you know drought floods cyclones uh, pest attacks and so on and so forth but the pm fasal fasal bima yojana which we thought that will the allocation under this head will be improved and, and the scheme itself should be further improved there is need for reform and the allocation this year is only 16000 crore of rupees as against 15695 last year so even to de risk agriculture to minimize the risk in agriculture for the farmers i think uh, no substantial improvement or effort has been made in this another important scheme is pm krishi sichai yojana irrigation kind of thing so this year it is 4000 crore of rupees which is at the last year's level and what you find again in the last year's revised expenditure it was as low as rupees 2500 uh, 2563 crore so we all the on the one hand we say per drop more crop every every khet will have irrigation facility and we see this kind of focus on irrigation this is really unfortunate at this particularly i feel bad because i have been all through praising this government uh, on their focus on agriculture and all that but this year i think i am really disappointed pm kisan sampadai yojana is another very important scheme which is uh, important from the point of your pro- promoting food processing sector and uh, they say will create uh, infrastructure for or even the new farm lodge uh, one of the objectives is to promote food processing and that's why there is so much of concession uh, for the food processors that and the government will not intervene even if they are hoarding or they are speculating or whatever they are doing for local trading or exports whatever so under the essential commodity act that was one of the things uh, but here you find even for this the allocation has been slashed from rupees 1081 crore last year to rupees 700 only this year and the actual expenditure also last year it was only 750 crores so i don't know what really we are doing then we have mandrega the flexive scheme we have seen um, all the every year in fact they say there will be some kind of tinkering and i feel bad but also because uh, when i was hearing the uh, you know budget discussion or debate and in which uh, the chief economic advisor and also the principal advisor in the finance ministry they participated uh, they say our focus is now different we don't believe in dolls so as if some of these programs are dolls and they believe in investment driven high profile infrastructure led growth and uh, and and that will take care of uh, uh, poverty and professor mudubey in the main morning was talking about inequality that they have not mentioned they are clearly mentioning sir that in, that is not our focus uh, our, their focus is basically high how this kind of investment driven or market driven uh, growth and through infrastructure development Uh, will you know create growth which will reduce poverty not necessarily inequality they no not talk up on inequality because that that in which they don't believe they don't believe this present regime and particularly their advisers they don't believe in this so as a result we don't expect that this kind of thing will really you know, come into discussion uh, manrega as i said and also gram sadak yojana i think uh, even pm awas yojana we always tom tom saying tom saying that uh, you know the construction sector housing sector will revive which will create lot of employment in the both in rural and urban areas but uh, this is the fact that allocation remains at last year's level at rupees 1900 19500 crore and uh, there is no change and in the case of mandrega there was some improvement last year but again it has been slashed to 73000 crore only so based on some of the important risk schemes i don't see any sign that um, i think uh, 
the government is really addressing the kind of uh, demand push issue what we have been discussing so far they don't believe in that they say these are all doors so <laughs> Uh, they are not going to do it this way anyway at least that is the stand they are taking and uh, also we find that every year in the budget some new schemes will be announced it is effective of whether these are actually implemented or not as professor dube also has been saying in the morning that we should see what have been saying and doing in the last few years in terms of um, allocating funds whether you are utilizing or implementing these schemes or not at least for most of these schemes uh, i think there is no sign that they are really implementing it for example the union budget 2018 and 19 promised that there will be price deficiency payments in case the market prices fall below the minimum support prices of any agricultural commodity the government will intervene and uh, procure and try to stabilize the market but uh, i mean they have never even tried to implement it in fact when i was in niti ayog i at least uh, there was some discussion how to institutionalize this uh, involving apmcs and also some uh, traders and cooperatives and all that but even that discussion is not there anymore so i think uh, that is one secondly we also said that there will be upgradation and a strengthening of existing 22000 rural huts because in the villages we'll find farmers have to go you know 40 kilometers 50 kilometers 60 kilometers to sell their um, produce if they have to go to a organized market for sale there is no way they can afford the transportation cost they are all small farmers and even if they uh, so there was a suggestion even by the somanathan committee that uh, this kind of you know infrastructure should be created in uh, regulated markets or wholesale markets within a radius of 5 kilometers or so and uh, also in as i said in the last 2018 19 budget it was suggested that at least the existing huts weekly huts and all these are there so if they are upgraded and integrated to wholesale markets both electronically and otherwise some of the farmers at least if they are organized in as cooperatives or apios they will have increased access to market and get better prices but there is no sign that they have even initiated this kind of thing anywhere uh i'm sorry operation green for strengthening fpos agri logistics processing facility etc for perishables like tomato onion and potato this year they, they have said but again nothing has happened and this year again in the present budget they say uh, this will cover the operation green uh, scheme will cover 22 perishable commodities they could not even address the three commodities so far uh, they announced it in 2008 and now they say <laughs> to it this year the 22 commodities will be covered perishable commodities uh, so i don't know how they are going to do it and also they will say they said they they will help the tenant farmers to access institutional credit uh, as you know the fact even the uh, normal small and marginal farmers even some of the large farmers in eastern india they don't get institutional credit i think uh, they have to depend on the private money lenders and traders uh this year's budget again their new announcements is that um, apart from this 22 perishable products will to be covered under operation green program 1000 more mandis will be integrated with inam they say and modernization of five fishing harbors in kochi chennai baijag paradip and petwagat and also develop some inland fishing harbors and fish landing centers which will benefit the fishing communities and uh, also they talk about multi purpose seaweed parks to be established in tamil nadu especially uh, you know the region why but anyway i, I would don't spell out uh, which can help promote seaweed farming by coastal communities to improve their incomes mm. and uh, also they have said the micro irrigation fund the corpus of it and uh, nabard will be increased from 5000 crore to 10000 crore this next year finance minister's speech also mentioned that agricultural credit target would be enhanced to rupees 16.5 lakh crore in 2022 they don't talk about 21 22 they talk about 20 22 but anyway even if it happens i think it is good but that does not in practice happen as i said Uh, in the whole of eastern india and northeast 
India, I think the farmers don't have access to institutional credit. And uh, allocation for rural infrastructure development, they say, would be enhanced from 30,000 crore to 40,000 crore. It will be good if they do it. Uh, but one thing which they said probably to please the agitating farmers is that agriculture infrastructure fund would be made available to APMC also for augmenting their infrastructure facilities. Because the, there is a general feeling that APMC Mondays will be dismantled or you know, nothing will be done for them. But at least this budget talks about it. I don't know whether they do it in reality, but at least they have talked, the finance minister has talked about it. The agriculture infrastructure fund will be made available to APMCs for augmenting their infrastructure facilities. This announcement should be reassuring that there is no intention of the government to either dismantle or weaken the APMCs. To conclude, I think the union budget 2021-22 has not probably met the farmer's expectations. In fact, the farmer's expectations, as I said, was high because of the government promised to double their incomes by 2022. And also, I think a lot of things are happening to put them in distress. The uh, unfavorable agriculture terms of trade and falling agricultural exports, uh, not having institutional credit, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, at least we thought in order to boost effective demand in the economy for overall economic recovery, uh, even to that, they have not paid any attention. And, and agriculture, rural development, everybody expected that that will be the engine of um, growth recovery uh, in the years to come if they really pump money into the agriculture and rural sector. And uh, unfortunately, this has not happened. I will stop here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, basically, uh, the main point on which uh, the entire presentation revolves is that uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the farmer's education uh, is not on the question of the uh, three legislations, right. but on the question rooted in the general crisis in the agriculture sector. Right. And he has brought out uh, uh, how this crisis prevails and that uh, the measures taken are either inadequate or non-existent to deal with this crisis in the budget, except some promises made, mm -hmm. which if fulfilled uh, can go some distance towards uh, mitigating this crisis. Uh, now I give the floor to Professor Govinda to speak on education and, and in general on the general budget if you like. Professor Govinda. He was, uh, yeah, yeah, easy, uh, easy. yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dubey, and uh, thank you, Dr. Nityananda, and uh, all others who are here. It's a great opportunity for me to share some views. Um, uh, as, uh, as we know, the this uh, budget was presented as a historic budget. I think it is historical in a way, at least when we come to education, because in the history of uh, this country, this is for the first time that the education budget has been slashed to this level. It has never happened. Always we have never been happy with the allocation that was made to education, but it was never slashed in the way the, it has been slashed uh, this time for education. From that point of view, I think it is a historic budget for slashing uh, education. Uh, there has been a reduction of about 6,000 crores uh, from uh, last year's uh, allocation to this year's 5,000 crores. School education itself has suffered 5,000 crores reduction has come for that. Now, uh, why, why this is important to really mention here is that we have been talking about uh, distress situation in the economy, but I think we are in a real distress situation in education in this country. Uh, for the last one year, schools and colleges have been closed. The world over, all relief packages have really highlighted the problem of education and provided special allocation for education uh, all over the world. But in India, we have chosen to reduce 
allocation for education which is a very strange phenomenon that i find uh, not found anywhere else in the world under this pan pandemic condition that we are going through uh, i was looking at in terms of the uh, total if we you see the total budget if you look at the overall sum has increased uh, and it used to be last year the education school education share in the total budget used to be 2.18% and this year it has come down to 1.74% so it is not only about 5000 crore doesn't fully represent our lowest priority for education if you look at in terms of school education proportionately to what we are spending overall or alloc budget allocation and wh what it, the school education gets it is even more uh, significantly reduced and i was also looking at the some analysis done by the center for child rights about budget allocation for children children budget they have tried to really do it uh, which used to be going back in uh, 2012 13 which used to be 4.76% of the total budget used to be child budget child related child protection child education and all of them used to be together child nutrition and others uh, but this uh, from 4.76 in 2012 13 consistently it has come down during all these years and now it stands at only 2.46% the child budget if you look at whatever allocation that is made for child which includes education nutrition and protection altogether it has come down to only 2.46% this you know this is why i am highlighting this reduction is that with this reduction in the budget for education attention being paid to education whatever gain we had got during the last 10 15 years whatever it may be that in terms of enrollment and provision of infrastructure is going to collapse this year if we everyone was expecting that there will be increased allocation for education to make up for the loss that has happened uh, because what is happening if we look at in terms of the uh, centrally sponsored schemes allocation up uptake that is what money has been transferred to the state governments for this because we all know that in school education particularly states have come to depend so much on the centrally sponsored scheme of samagra shiksha abhiyan sarva shiksha abhiyan and then madhyamik shiksha abhiyan and all they have only put in whatever comes from the central government for that they put in the counterpart funding that is what has happened but if you look at in terms of the uh, uh, normally uh, after the uh, revised budget uh, revised estimates the uptake goes up significantly and normally around 75% in december you will find that the expenditure of the mhrd would be there because they transfer money to the state governments this year this is this has been less than 60% has gone toward the end of the year now that mean that means that there has been already a lot of lag in terms of the allocation that has been received by the state governments for school education under the centrally sponsored schemes and now we are reducing it also further i think it will have a very very serious implication for what is happening because we should also appreciate what is happening at the state level because of the pandemic either there has been no teacher recruitment for the last one year and therefore there have been lot of positions which are vacant which they are not likely to fill in and second i think uh, the the maintenance of infrastructure school infrastructure for the last one one year has been in very miserable shape there has been no maintenance that has happened the schools are in very bad shape when the schools reopen people were expecting that there will be a package that would be there for rehabilitation of the post pandemic rehabilitation of the children in the school with improved improvement in the school infrastructure and all but unfortunately nothing such has happened and i think this is the second point that i want to make third uh, there are a few things like we find that the one area in which the additional allocation has come is for the mid day meals the mid day meals has received uh, around 500 crores more but this is also in a way deceptive i should tell you because we uh, we keep hearing every day about the uh, serious condition of malnutrition among the children and india not able to really make up for that at all and if we alongside midday meal you should also look at in uh, the, i should say that the this year 
the midday meal expenditure has gone down very significantly because the schools have not been able to distribute midday meal although the it was said that you know the midday meal should be given to the the children even if the schools are closed this has not happened in state after state the midday meal has not been distributed so this 500 crore in, uh, increase is a bit deceptive from that point of view second uh if we combine this with what has happened with respect to icds i think it is very important since we are talking about nutrition uh this uh, budget actually combines two schemes the one is the portion abhiyan scheme and the icds they have been merged this time earlier it was launched earlier portion abhiyan scheme uh, what is the portion 2.0 had been launched now this has been now merged with uh, Uh, this now what is the allocation that has come is that last year we had uh, 3400 crores for the portion abhiyan and 19412 crores for icds but what has now come for the merge scheme is only 19916 in effect we have slashed 4000 crores towards nutrition of children okay if we combine icds and then portion abhiyan which again is a very very serious issue because this will have an impact on the primary education because the more we more we don't protect the preschool level pre prior to primary level i think this will have a direct impact on this i won't take much time sir there are two or three schemes which have come which i should, i should think i should really uh, comment on one is the 15000 exemplar schools this is a this is in a way uh, a rehashing of the model school idea which had been earlier done now 15000 schools but the point is that you know this uh, there are no details about 15000 exemplar schools how it will be done you know this is going back to what professor dar was pointing out earlier we used to have the planning commission five year plans and therefore the schemes in, need to be used to be worked out and then the the annual allocation has to used to come budget allocation used to come towards the scheme that are there in operation now actually there is no way to really know what we what is the thinking of the government at all so this is the new thinking that has come to start 15000 exemplar schools they are called exemplar schools model schools what is going to happen we don't know this may be another way of public private partnership uh, which was floated during the upa time also i am afraid what is going to come we do not know about that a second uh, program that has been said for which additional allocation that has been made is about eklavya pattern modern uh, model residential schools for which uh, it has been said that there will be 750 such new schools will come up but unfortunately if you look at this is not a new scheme this is an older scheme which for which uh, already money had been allocated but i was looking at the website of the 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 ministry and ministry says that out of 500 schools that had been uh, uh, that have been allocated earlier only 173 have been operationalized till now i do not know what exactly we mean by adding another 750 schools are we going to really take that part of it which has not been operationalized and include here or this is additionality how we want to do why it has not been done earlier again planning commission used to really evaluate in terms of seeing if schemes are working or not and how it should be done but there are no there are no indications in terms of why this has been done when the previous scheme is not functioning at all this is another uh, issue that i want to point out third i think we a, a scheme which has been announced which is a new scheme that has been announced now which uh, bothers me is about opening of 100 sainik schools why it bothers me is that i think a little bit of history i should share with you here that uh, the idea of sainik schools was mooted in 1961 when krishna menon was the the defense minister and uh, it was thought that the the idea of a sainik school is that sainik schools will be something like a training ground for people who the, chil- the those who move out of the sainik schools can have a better access to the national defense academy that was uh, that was originally thought of it was meant for people uh, we know who would uh, so there is a special kind of a mental and physical training that would happen in the sainik schools this was in 1961 between 1961 and 19 uh, to, uh, to 2021 that is in the 60 years how many schools have come 
34 schools have come. I am saying all these things because uh, from NEPA we had evaluated the signing school uh, a few years ago and the defense uh, de um, ministry was very keen on reorganizing the schools. And the importance given to this is very high within the defense ministry. And uh, for every signing school, which are only 34, the GOC in command in the local command chairs the board of management of that school. That's the kind of importance given by the, the, the defense ministry to each of these signing schools. Now we say we are going to open 100 schools. I don't know why suddenly such love has come from 34 to 100 more schools. I am, I am not too convinced of this uh, sudden love, how it has come. I, I do see some, some other consideration that must be there. Second, what bothers me even more is that this is going to be taken out of the defense ministry and it will be done as, an, uh, it will be done as collaboration with non-governmental organizations. It bothers me. Something which has been very well protected because it can affect our security issues also. It's a very, very serious issue. I hope more people will really reflect and write on this, that this could really threaten, you know, if 100 schools are created with the NGO signs and NGOs, we don't know what kind of NGOs that they will get, which will which can uh, really lead to uh, creating the students, children who will be trained and oriented in uh, parochial considerations and who will enter into the defense forces in course of time. If this is the way they are really looking at, I think it bothers me that not only about sudden love for 100 schools, which raises questions, but also that, that this will be handed over and done through public-private partnership and non-governmental organizations, which is a very serious issue. Why open up defense sector suddenly in this fashion, in training people in this fashion, which has not happened during the last 60 years? It is a serious issue. I would also like to add here that the Beti Bachao Beti Padao, which has been launched and then projected in a very big way uh, during the last few years. Now, now, you know, this has been merged now again. You see, this is the problem with many of these schemes is that quietly you forget them and then leave them out. Now, the Beti Bachao Beti Padao Andolan, like the portion Abhyan being merged with ICDS, this is being merged with uh, something called Shakti. That is, uh, that's a that's a scheme that is already there. This is being merged with that, and I was. We, if you look at in terms of what has happened to this during the uh, in uh, during the last few years, for only forty five percent of the money allocated to uh, Betty Bacha was really sanctioned and spent by the government of India. And, and that is why I'm saying this, that while we talk about the school education, girls' education and all this, and so much we talk about women empowerment and everything. But what has really happened is that we have really reduced all these things, merged them, neglected them, sidelined them, the schemes that have been launched for that. I'll just take two minutes to tell about two things about higher education. There's not much to say about higher education, sir. In fact, higher education, uh, uh, besides the fact that, you know, 1000 crores has been launched, there has been nothing new that has been said. Uh, three things that have been, uh, one is actually they have recycled, this budget recycles ideas which had been floated a few years earlier. The two, two themes that have been brought back is the Higher Education Commission and the, na uh, the National Research Fund. Uh, we should remember that the, this was already in 2019 also it has been referred to, but nothing had happened. And uh, Higher Education Commission was also referred to several times earlier, but nothing has happened. Uh, but National Research Fund this time has been allocated uh, some so, such a huge money, some 10,000 crores has been allocated, which should appear very, very impressive. Many people, scientists have said that, no, it's a great idea that, you know, we are supporting research and all. But the problem, if you read the fine print, is that the, this money has been allocated over a period of five years. It's not for this year. Uh, and uh, we have found actually in the previous plans, uh, previous uh, budgets also, whatever has been allocated for a long term, expenditure that doesn't take off seriously in the initial years. So I am not too sure that anything will happen under this research fund also this year. And since it is over five years, it has been done. And that, uh, that also means that the expenditure pattern has not been worked out yet. Allocation pattern has not been worked out yet. And the norms of uh, granting has not been 
collected. I think it's 50,000 crores for NRF has been uh, provided. So that is uh, what uh, uh, what has happened. Now, there is one new scheme that has been suggested is the umbrella structure at the city level for, uh, uh, for uh, central organization that will be created. Uh, but this also, there are no details that are given. And all that the government of India seems to be interested in spending is what they call the GLU fund, which is what the, the budget uh, document is, is talking about. Otherwise, uh, there is nothing new. Uh, we have cut down 1,000 crores and nothing new that has happened, which essentially means that we have abandoned uh, the higher education sector almost completely to the privatization, private forces. This is a very clear indication that is coming out by the slash that has happened to higher education in this budget. Last point that I want to make is that... Um, you know, with a lot of fanfare, a few years ago, in 2017, we had launched what is called the Higher Education Finance uh, or something, HIFA uh, Agency, Higher Education Finance Agency. And it was announced that, you know, from now onwards, all the institutions will have to really take money from the Higher Education Finance Agency, and we will not give any grant. They will be in the form of loans and uh, from the agency, which will be equity-based uh, support will be given by the central government for them. But what has happened now, by 2021, we have realized that this is the failed effort. There has been no, uh, the money that has not gone, up, no, the universities have not really heeded this and they have not been able to borrow. And all that, that the government is going to do now is to, uh, is to really pay for the interest on the loan that were, they, were, they had taken. And if you read the budget details, all those things, that is what we find that the, what is being allocated for various agencies is that the, that that towards the interest that the, the, uh, the government of India is going to clear. So I am afraid that, you know, the higher education, the government of India doesn't seem to be even thinking about higher education, what to do. Higher education, like school education, even more so higher education in such a state of crisis. And all that we seem to be talking about is only about IITs, IIMs. We have increased the allocation for this. We have increased the allocation for central, uh, central schools and then Navodhya schools. Uh, government of India seems to be thinking their responsibility is only about their own institutions, not about the education sector of this country, but only about their own institutions, which are directly controlled by government of India. Is government of India's responsibility? I think it is a very serious issue. Uh, we need to, uh, the, the government of India has to own the education system of this country and think about improving the education system of this country. Budget should really relate to all these things, not just about increasing allocation for central schools, the Modiya schools, central, uh, central universities, and then IITs and IAMs, which are under direct control of the government of India. These are the few points that came to my mind. Sir, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much for this detailed presentation. And now I turn to Professor Rama Baru, who will be speaking on, uh, you know, a component of the budget which has been most widely, widely publicized. So let's uh, try to be wiser on that. Uh, Professor Rama Baru. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nityanand, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mochkundube, and CSD for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, the advantage I have is I have very closely listened to all the speakers in the morning, and I am going to just focus on health, but in the overall context of the remarks made on the budget. Um, firstly, I want to say yes, um, as Mr. Dubey said, this uh, there's a lot of hype around the increase on health. But I think there are many smoke screens, which I will try to um, sort of address uh, as we look through what is actually happening in the health sector. With the COVID pandemic, I think we faced a huge humanitarian crisis. We faced a huge healthcare crisis. It was very clear through the COVID pandemic that it was the public sector's responsibility to take care of all the needs. The private sector basically absolved itself self of any responsibility and the government did not really act to either nationalize the private sector during the pandemic. 
So you had a weak public sector, which responded, in my view, uh, quite admirably, especially client health workers, and with the adequate protection, protective measures. We know all those stories. So in that context, you would have expected that. And this is a global issue that is being raised that the public sector investment is absolutely critical in future, not just about the pandemic that uh, the pandemic actually showed us the fault lines. And this could have been addressed through a very robust investment in the uh, health services. Now, 137 percent, as Praveen Jha and uh, even Vishwajit Dhar had mentioned earlier, it to me is a smokescreen because it is actually um, bringing in water supply, sanitation and health uh, services into one big pool. And in that, there are many different funding sources that are being brought in to show this uh, what is a very dramatic uh, increase. If you only look at health services, and this was again commented by many commentators on the budget, it's only 11% increase. And if you take in inflation of, say, about 6%, in real terms, you're really talking about a 5% increase. The important point that Praveen made, which I think is very uh, is very important, especially when it comes to health, is the opacity of the budget, because you are uh, sort of conflating a whole lot of sources of funding, and we are not quite sure from the budget figures what is coming from where. I also want to say what uh, Dr. Govind Rao said was very, very important, uh, because the nutrition budget should also be seen in relation to the health budget. So because we know that stunting in children is still very high, nutrition support for children and mothers through the ICDS is very critical. But the point that he makes is that with this uh, merging of Poshan Abhyan and ICDS, you actually see a slashing of Fine. So this is these are the smoke screens I'm alluding to because I think when you say oh fantastic we've done 137 percent and we can be applauded for that I'm sorry we cannot be applauded. I also see this budget in a longitudinal sense um, because I think the budget itself to me is quite insignificant. What we need to see is that to the efforts for uh, the pre-budget in the last one year uh, has been towards more privatization of health services. If you, re if you look at the 15th Finance Commission recommendations, if you look at it in relation to the Niti Aayog's proposal for the health sector, and if you look at the, um, the, the kind of uh, the high-level group that was set up by the PMO, for health, they are all moving towards greater privatization. They are talking about public-private partnerships in the health sector. Now, in all of this, this 11% increase is for the health and wellness centers. It is for setting up labs. Now, I will come to that a little later. But what is important for us to understand is the health and wellness center investments are necessary for the project of public-private partnerships. I'll give you one example. The Niti Aayog uh, Subcommittee on Medical Education has made it very clear that they're going to privatize medical education. They're going to elicit um, uh, private finance into medical education. But the private medical colleges require hospitals for training of their doctors. And what they are proposing is that district hospitals will partner with private medical colleges to provide a public-private partnership and the private medical college will actually redefine the role of the district hospital. So, I mean, if you, if those of you are interested, that document is very, very important. So this is one. The other is a lot of the curative services are being talked about in a PPP mode. The 11% increase, which with, I mean, minus the inflation, et cetera. Um, what, are we, what is going to happen to uh, employment, increased employment and secure employment for our health workers? If you look at in most states today, it is all contracted out um, doctors contracted uh, out, uh, contracting in. Uh, so the doctors, the health workers, the ashas, everybody is being pretty much in a contract mode. 
So the, the, with the 11% increase, you're not going to be able to really build the human resources and health in any significant manner. The other very interesting aspect of this budget, again another smokescreen, is that the government of India has already um, gone in for loan negotiations with three very important international bodies. One is the ADB, the second is the World Bank, and the third is the Gates Foundation. And if you look at all the loan agreements for these, this happened in the 2020 July, from July onwards, uh, they are all addressing strengthening urban health systems, strengthening preventive care, and strengthening uh, the setting up of these laboratories, the public health laboratories, the surveillance. So it's very interesting. The, the statement from the budget speech of the finance, I mean, the finance minister is actually a direct quote from the World Bank document on what are the areas that require strengthening. So to me, this is another smokescreen in the sense that we are, we are, as a continuation of the 1991, let's not forget 1991, we are actually moving into the health sector with a loan uh, financing system. So, you know, this, uh, the, the actual spending of the government on the uh, health sector becomes more and more questionable. The other very important aspect, which I do believe is important, is that the private sector, both the drug industry as well as the hospital industry, has been pushing the government for subsidies for themselves, but more importantly, that they want a very strong public sector infrastructure, so which they can use when they feel that their resources are dwindling or their profit margins are falling. So I find that this really the budget is to me a very clear departure in another stage that is taking privatization the level. It requires the health and wellness investments because for all preventive care, no private sector is going to come to do that. If you want to ensure mass vaccination of your population, no private sector, I mean, the private sector will come in at a cost where people will have to pay. But the um, actual mass vaccination programs will have to be done by your frontline workers in the public sector. So it's all the areas with, where the private sector will not be willing to come in are being now uh, invested in. But that investment is not only the government investment. And that is the point I want to make. The other very important aspect of this budget is the increased water supply sanitation. And if you look at the water supply and sanitation, it has very, right from the beginning, including the Swachh Bharat Abhyan, has been uh, an avenue for private investment to come in. The public sector is, it's not as if you're building a comprehensive system of waste management and other things, but you're opening up for technology to come in. Now, this is another very important area where the government is soliciting public-private partnership, both in health and in uh, allied areas, which is the use of technology to come in. So whether it's telemedicine, or it is bringing in technologies to clean up your environment or to do other things, you're really opening up spaces for not only national, domestic private capital, but you're actually opening up to global private capital. And I think this, these are the kinds of trends that I see and the many smoke screens that exist in this process. Now, for example, let's take the development of our vaccine you have, and, and sorry, one last thing is that this whole scheme is being called Atma Nirbhar Swastya, PM's Atma Nirbhar Swastya Yojana. The Atma Nirbhar is not about more of public sector or more of public investment, but that Atma Nirbhar is to facilitate the greater privatization, which has already been designed for over the last two years. So, in a sense, to me, the COVID pandemic has not touched the government in any moral or in an ethical way. It has not really uh, addressed the needs of the health sector adequately. There is great opacity in the budget figures, and therefore, I think the budget figure is are not 
the important things. I think we need to look at the trends that have emerged, the, the, the ways in which the government has responded. And I think one of the earlier speakers had mentioned the budget exercise itself in that sense does not have the same uh, importance that it used to have in, in earlier times. And uh, it's really a tragedy that the nutrition budget has been dealt with in the way it has. So um, I'll stop here. I know we have uh, sort of exceeded our time. And uh, if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to take it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> We were planning to have uh, at least half an hour for uh, question and comments, uh, but uh, we don't have the time. But I would still try to, with your permission, extend it for at least 15 minutes. So, uh, and then I would request the people who uh, are going to ask uh, questions uh, uh, to confine themselves to asking questions. And at uh, this stage, and uh, not to make comments of their own. We would very much like to hear all of you, but you know the time constraint. So now any anyone who would like to ask questions from the floor? I see that uh, everybody is looking forward to lunch. Uh, so shall we then conclude? Akhil? Yeah, uh, I have I no specific... I want to ask uh, oh, something. Yes, Sushmita. Yes, yes Sushmita, go ahead. So, uh, recognizing that this is a really difficult time, I uh, look forward to some uh, solutions or suggestions from the speakers, like what uh, could have been done in this difficult situation so that things would be better. Mm. And I would also like to make an intervention. It's not a question. I mean, uh, uh, last year, Professor K.B. Saxena used to speak on social se se uh, sector development uh, schemes and in, in, in budget. He's not, uh, I mean, uh, he didn't join us today. Uh, it has been quite well established, Professor Praveen Jha, because he works on budget, but he knows. I mean, for the last 15, 16 years, this SCAP, uh, Shudulka sub, uh, Subplan and Tribal Subplan, they have never been allocated money in proportion to what they, they should have obtained. And the trend has continued in this budget also. In fact, uh, uh, the Honorable FM didn't even mention uh, these SCP and TSP in her plan. And interestingly, uh, one very important scheme uh, pertaining to uh, post metric uh, fellowship to SCs and ST students, the scheme uh, has been grappling with, with low or inadequate budgetary allocations for the past many years. And uh, allocations haven't been increased yet. And uh, in a very uh, uh, characteristic fashion, they have allocated uh, 35,000 crore rupees uh, for uh, for a period of ne uh, next four years, I mean, in in, in union budgets, we used to uh, uh, to uh, to read uh, allocations for one one uh, financial year. They have allocated it for uh, next four years without mentioning how will that money be spent. And the most important issue pertaining to uh, MoMA. Uh, this Ministry of Minority Affairs as well as uh, Ministry of, uh, of uh, Tribal Affairs is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, non-spending of the uh, money that has been allocated to these departments and, and, and ministries. And if you see the actuals that have been uh, released for the year 2018-19, the trend has been continued. So, uh, I mean, the previous governments as well as this this government for past six years, they, they don't they look serious for any uh, uh, efforts to bridge the development gap between SCSTs and, uh, and other uh, general social groups. Uh, this is all. No, I think that uh, relating to Sushmita's question, in the overall context, uh, what should have really been done is to, uh, you know, make provisions for demand stimulation. And uh, I would request uh, uh, Biswajit to uh, elaborate it a little bit. 
uh, differentially uh, than Professor Chang? Yes, I think, uh, you know, um, we have to see what can be, what could have been done. And in my intervention, I tried to uh, focus on some of these uh, points because, you know, all the uh, um, uh, colleagues in the panel have uh, mentioned about uh, how expenditure has been slashed in, in extremely critical areas, you know, right from... Uh, education, health, agriculture, you name it, I think, you know, there has been uh, uh, a slashing of expenditure by the government. So that's why I was actually mentioning, you know, I didn't want to uh, uh, elaborate because I knew our colleagues are going to be mentioning about, uh, you know, given the details, that, you know, all this hoopla about uh, 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 the government spending and everyone looking at the fiscal deficit to say that, you know, there has been a big push by the government. You know, this is, this is, uh, this sounds absolutely ridiculous uh, to, to uh, say the very least, because what the government has actually done is that, you know, it has fitted away uh, resources to areas or to, uh, uh, in, in areas where it is absolutely not, not, not desirable. Uh, it has actually uh, not garnered resources from where it should have actually done this. And at the end of the day, we are having a situation where, uh, you know, uh, uh, sectors uh, uh, which are absolutely imperative for, uh, uh, you know, for focused attention is if this country has to, this economy has to go anywhere forward out of this uh, pandemic, you know, those have been completely... Um, uh, left to the mercy of, uh, I think, I think, I think cronies. Uh, now that is something that uh, uh, has to be highlighted here. Um, now I was, you know, in the pre-budget, and I was actually doing an exercise. I was uh, looking at four budgets, uh, earlier budgets, where uh, which were presented after either a, you know, a, a, a war, a, a conflict situation, or an economic downturn. And it started with uh, the 58-59 budget of uh, Bandit Nehru, which was after the the, the economic uh, crisis that that, that that the country faced. The 63-64 budget of Moradji Desai, 73-74 budget of Yvi Chauhan, and 91-92 budget of uh, Manmohan Singh. Now, um, in each of the budgets, and it was absolutely striking, that all these budgets actually targeted uh, either luxury uh, consumer goods or uh, or those sections of the society who need to be taxed, and it had uh, it had it brought in that that dimension. Uh, now it's incredible that this uh, exercise, this entire budgetary exercise, ra in, in, instead of taxing those who should be, you know, is actually giving uh, concessions to those. Uh, who, who don't deserve it at all. So I think uh, uh, this is the hallmark of the budget. That And, and I think uh, um, uh, uh, several uh, speakers, uh, Professor Haq, uh, Professor Govinda, and also Rama have mentioned this, that, you know, the, 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 the objective function is really to hand over resources of the state uh, to the cronies. And this is the budget making exercise all about, uh, and 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 this is what we have seen. So, uh, you know, it is is difficult to say how you can fix fix a problem where the government is not intending to do go go in that direction. So it's it's like that proverbial say, saying that you know you can you can wake up a person who's actually sleeping, but the person who's actually pretending to sleep, how do you wake that person up? So the, the 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 frustration today is that you know you have a government which is just not interested in going down the path that all of us are in, are wanting the government to move. It wants to move move in a completely different direction. So the task before us be, uh, becomes even more difficult. So Praveen wanted to say something. <coughs> Uh, sir, you have to unmute your mic. Yes, yes, uh, yes. it's uh, it's okay, Nona. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Just two, three points. Uh, <clears throat> the first obvious thing. This is in response to what Sushmita asked. 
is um, to acknowledge the problem. <clears throat> There is a problem, but you know, as 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 uh, Professor Dhar said just now, if you want to be an ostrich, fine. I mean, w w what can be done? Now, you know, the Financial Times of London, which is supposed to be one of the most, you know, iconic uh, spokesperson for right-wing economics, that said, in early August that we have to change the way of doing what needs to be done in the context of the pandemic and so on and talks of a lot of public sector investments, lot, you know, a lot of things which uh, generally economists associated with the left of center, you know, highlight. That is, I mean, all of you should, uh, to, you know, those of you who are not familiar with it should look at that FT editorial of early August. Right. So there is a hell of a lot that we know what needs to be done. Right? None of that was done. If anything, you know, even this claim of uh, additional expenditure, as I mentioned, is a definitional jugglery. I mean, how, how, I mean do you really think that the entire nation is a bunch of fools? They can't uh, uh, figure out what uh, very basics are. Yeah. So. What needed to be done, as has been emphasized repeatedly, is to step up all those processes, expenditures, etc., which revive demand, number one. Number two, to do all that, then you need resources. Yeah, And again, I mean, I think I follow in the footsteps of Vishwajit on this completely, that unusual times require you know, maybe unusual interventions. Even if you are steeped in this broader neoliberal orthodoxy and so on, at least acknowledge that this is a very difficult time and do some things. I'll give you only one example, and several countries have done this. Yeah, Argentina has several countries. Let me not, for lack of time, I will not get into the details. Can we think of at least a solidarity tax on those who can afford it? At least for one year, at least for two, three years. As per 2019 estimate, in India, the total wealth of the dollar billionaires is about 560 lakh crores. <clears throat> Think of 1% tax on their wealth, 5.6 lakh crores. If we assume that this wealth is being inherited, passing on generation to generation and so on, think of some percentage, 25, 30, whatever percent is appropriate for inheritance tax, something in the neighborhood of, let's say, uh, your corporate tax or whatever, right? We are looking at a fabulous figure of 10, 12, 15 lakh crores. Why not? So, Susmita and other young friends, it is important for us to recognize two things. That there is just no will. Given the kind of trap that this government is in, in terms of its thinking, its friendship with uh, certain kinds of, you know, people, so to say, <laughs> that is out. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, there is one question uh, in the chat box uh, for Professor uh, Rama Baru. Madam, I think you have read the question. Would you like to respond to it? This is this uh, center state. Uh, I have replied on. We've been having a chat in the chat box. So, okay. Uh, okay. Basic, uh, two, I, I just want to highlight two more important issues as far as health is concerned. You see, a lot of there has been a gradual centralization of health, certain health schemes, and these have become very important populist programs and are being used uh, in their elections, state elections. So, you know, whether it's the Aishman Bharat or many of the other cash transfer schemes that have been put in place for health, it's for uh, hospitalization, etc. It has a certain populism which it uh, creates and you know you people actually feel 
and this has been one of the important departures in the welfare sector as far as this government is concerned that this you know plethora of uh, populist programming and the depth and the height of which we cannot really understand and how it actually in terms of governance uh, spans out at the state level um is is a, is a very important issue and if you look at the finance commission if you look at it in relation to what the economic survey says and you look at the budget they are all out of sync because the 15th finance commission actually you know says that you need to finance health much more and uh, the analysis done in the economic survey is actually a good analysis but in the uh, translation so you know somebody i think in the morning said so will the will his job be on the line because <laughs> you know clearly <laughs> <laughs> you said it praveen uh, i think it's it's a, it's a particularly exemplified in the case of health right so um I, i'm just uh, saying that uh, really the center state issue is very important to what extent does this government actually respect federalism uh, what is you saw the whole gst issue also and that that the states as far as health is concerned are actually in the red because they have battled the covid pandemic with limited resources and they are finding other ways to finance you know so i think uh, this is a, a very very important issue uh, i think there is one uh, there is one more question in the chat box it is uh, by professor vivek i think uh, vivek kumar professor jha may be, uh, may like to respond to it and the question is about uh, Uh, i mean he is making a point that we all are talking about budget allocations that have been made in this union budget but there has been a very little dis uh, discussion on actual budgeting or uh, actual expenditure and the figures that have been uh, uh, released uh, uh, recently they show a very deplorable picture that is the actual actual expenditure has been very low than what was allocated last year in the union budget so professor jha if you would like to respond to this Uh, you see i think uh, i'll uh, respond very briefly because we have really run out of time you know uh, two things need to be noted uh, in general you know the quality of expenditure etc is one very important concern so you should not be looking only at the quantity number two as it happens for last several years you know actual is more than the revised which is uh, more than the final sorry budget estimate is more than the revised and then the Uh, revised is uh, sort of uh, more than the actual expenditure that always happens now this time what has happened is essentially in some segments some pockets in fact the revised was more than the budgeted and that we need to acknowledge for, for instance as as has already been mentioned narega uh, and so on so forth so yes so it was unusual and uh, in that sense uh, but yes the whole I mean, one we need to examine uh these estimates much more carefully both for quantity and quality thank you thank you so we conclude now i think we have now reached the outer limit of the time that we set uh, thank you very much all of you for uh, joining us and giving such a, a well studied and detailed presentation in each area a very very enriching uh, discussion and uh, we will try to Uh, bring out something uh, you know, within a couple of days. So thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, roping in this conversation, all of us. Thank you. It was lovely thank conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Yeah. Should we close? Should we close the meeting, sir? I think. Yes, we close. Yeah. I, I yeah. think that. Uh, we have we have in our part uh, you know satnarayan katha where we invoke the gods to come uh, and then at the end they, they just in sentence that uh, sarve deva swasthanam gacha all, all you go gods you go back to your own place <laughs> no this time the gods are there in their places places sir <laughs> we don't have to go we are just here <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you sir.